Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us John Briggs, who's the founder and CEO with Insight Tax. John, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Mike. Hey, so I want to dive into what you do and how you serve your clients, but give us a little bit of your background and story and how you got into the industry. So I'm a CPA. I have a firm here in Salt Lake City. We're about 120 team members. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I had a mentor in my life uh, after my freshman year in college, and uh, we spent some time on some service projects. And he said, hey, you know, you'd be pretty good going into something like business or law related. And so Hmm. I took an accounting class and uh, first time in my life, really, that a subject hit, like it just resonated completely with my mind. Everything else, I was a hard working student, but I worked hard. And it so accounting just kind of clicked. And then from there, I got into tax and I realized that a lot of the uh, country is bullied by the IRS. And here is an organization that's given authority to effectively be bullies. And I didn't really like that very much. So I found it kind of matched my love for accounting with my desire to keep people from being bullied. And then we just kind of grew over the years. And here we are yeah. 120 team members later. Wow, that's amazing. And and I think you're right that, you know, when something resonates, it resonates. And, you know, if, if in college, for me, when I took accounting, I threw up a little bit in my mouth. So it's the, it was the exact opposite. <laughs> so we need people like you because if, if everyone was in marketing, then it would be a, kind of a boring world. So we've got to have people like you to, to help us out. So I think that is awesome. So I love how on your website, you, uh, you've you got like this, this, you know, front and center, growing your wealth by minimizing tax and managing cash. And so you that's typically not a message you would think that a CPA service or a bookkeeping CPA accounting service would have because that's talking about wealth. Well, I always I love that because I always think of like wealth and and uh, uh, cash flow as the old proverbial bucket and water and when there's holes in it there's flowing out so you don't need more water to go in it you know you need to plug up the holes as much as possible so talk a little bit about your approach there to growing wealth by minimizing tax and managing cash. It, one of the things that I noticed, uh, depending on the demographic, but there's a high percentage where. It just seemed like their only goal was me to tell them how they could reduce their taxes. But then I started asking them follow-up questions. Okay, well, do you have a financial goal in the future? Do you plan on ever getting a loan in the future? Are you trying to grow your business? Uh, And all those things kind of led to, all right, well, we want to maximize the tax code to our ability, but there are ways that we can maximize it to make sure you're still going to qualify for those loans so that your growth doesn't get impeded. So that was kind of the first trigger for me when I realized I, I want to see a mindset shift. And let me just save taxes for the sake of saving taxes versus let me save taxes so that I can now utilize what I've saved for things that will enrich my life later on. Because ultimately, yes. most small business owners, for example, reselling their business sounds nice, but it's a small percentage that sell their business for a retirement able amount. And so we like to encourage people, if you have the right system set up throughout your career and growing your business, then you're going to be all set. And then when you sell your business, all that's just the gravy on top or the icing or the whatever delicious liquid you want to put on top. (laughs) Yeah. You know, um, I like how you say, you know, we don't want to just do this for the sake of doing this, right? So let's not just save you taxes and minimize your taxes for the sake of, okay, there we go. But what are we going to do with it? You know, and I know uh, back in the late 90s, I was in the mortgage industry and I would have clients that would uh, come in for a debt consolidation refinance and they'd pay off the credit cards and we'd free up 700 a month. And a few years later, I'd see them again. And I'm like, 
you, you ran your credit card. Come on, we need to change this behavior. So I love that you say, yeah, it's fine that we're going to minimize tax and increase cash flow, but what are we going to do with it? You know, and 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 you become the widget that is a a lever to accomplish more. So yeah, 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 we do taxes and and tax planning and CPA and all of that, but it fits into a bigger plan. Exactly. Love it. So uh, what are the typical, when you are meeting with a business owner for the first time, what is the typical place that you're um, noticing that you see the low hanging fruit first? They may come in for one thing, but you're looking at something going, okay, yeah, but we need to start here. So the most specific low hanging fruit is entity selection. And Mm. when I say entity, it's a fancy legal term, right? That classifies what your business is set up as. So that's an LLC or partnership or a corporation, or some people are sole proprietors. All that stuff, sometimes people just take advice from whoever else they knew or they respect. And that person they respect may not actually have any knowledge related to the right entity. So we like to have great attorneys in our pipeline because a great attorney with a good CPA, even a mediocre CPA, they can marry the proper legal protection with the best tax savings. And uh, a lot of times, based on the way you earn income, you there are better tax, out, uh, better tax entities. So for example, if I provide a service, the IRS calls that ordinary income, or sometimes they call it self-employment income. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's taxed in a specific way where, for example, having an S corporation in your tax structure is going to minimize some of self-employment tax. If I earn income from real estate properties, those that's considered passive income. So I don't have necessarily self-employment tax that's tied to it. Well, I'm, I'm going to want a different entity structure for rental income, for example, than I do for income that I earn generating revenue through services or consulting that I provide. Uh, so low, that's the most specific lowest hanging fruit. The second is it's still low hanging fruit, but it's more generic because it is pretty specific to the unique scenario of everybody. But we do love it when clients will take the time with us to go through like the last three months of expenses. Mm. And two comments are always made (laughs) in this process. One is, I thought I canceled that transaction. Mm. Or two, I have no idea what that is. Uh, a lot of times as we get into the hustle and bustle with our, our businesses, we um, kind of don't take the time to pause and realize that maybe a past dis- financial decision we made is no longer a service we're using anymore. Or like I mentioned, they th- they think it's canceled, but it didn't end up getting canceled. I mean, I one of my horror stories, which is humorous to the, us who didn't have to live it, Brand new client, we go through his books and I asked him, what's this $128 charge that's happening every month? Uh, and we looked at the vendor, the the vendor it sold basically a floor cleaning uh, machine. And he said, hold on, that's a payment. I bought this floor cleaning machine. Okay, but great. But then he said, but I've been making, I, that should have been paid off three years ago. Oh, I'm like, are you so this company was has been pulling $120 a month for an additional three years and you haven't stopped? No, like no one said, hey, take a minute to pause and let's check this out. Like so he wow thousands and thousands of dollars just because he had never taken the time prior to to check out some of his expenses. Wow. So so now at that point, that becomes, you know, a low hanging fruit because let's make sure your foundational, you know, business structure is in place. So that's great. But then what about um, you know, excess cash flow that you shouldn't be paying anymore that you didn't know about, or it's over and done with. So that frees up cash flow. Um, what is it that then you're doing with even other things like that to uncover some of those like tax savings and things? But when you come up with that number at the bottom of the sheet and you underline it twice and you go, here is a number that now we have freed up. Um, A, that's, I would suspect, not typical that your accountant slash CPA is doing for you. So there's a big gold star. But B, what is the reaction? And then what is the next step that you're saying? Okay, now we should do things like this. The most common reaction is relief. Uh, Because most 
people still have a, a level of consumer debt um, or business loans, or they've been needing to hire somebody with the way their company or business has grown, but they didn't know how to afford to pay it. Some people get to the end of the year and we tell them you owe this much in taxes. And if they're a first year client, a lot of times they'll say, I, there's no way I owe that much money. And so we yeah. have to go back through and it's like, you actually do. So then like, Hey, we freed up the ability for you to save some money going forward. So one of the things we do is implement a system called profit first. We're big proponents of the cash flow management system that Mike McCallowitz created in his book yes. titled profit first. Um, and so through that, we, if we can free up some cash again, most of the time, if they have debt, we're going to see if they're willing to put that extra payment towards the debt to, to pay that off. Because I feel like the interest expense, especially on consumer debt, you know, 15 to 30 percent, uh, not the cheapest form of borrowing money. And yes. uh, if we can free up that interest, not and then the principal payments, now you've it almost feels like you double found money. And uh, then we can apply it towards their growth. Do they are they even paying themselves enough? A lot of times they're not. So giving them the ability to pay themselves a market rate for the work they're putting to the business now protects their business from the owner getting burnout. So they're not going to want to close their doors. Um, if they are paying themselves enough, then setting aside some of the money for tax. Uh, but it it does depend on the client's goals. And we we just try to apply your typical good financial sound principles uh, like uh, richest man in Babylon ideas and, you know, yeah. those types of things. Neat. Uh, and then do you bring it, do you just make recommendations of what to do with that? Or do you bring in a team? Like, do you have like a wealth manager or do you say, let's bring your wealth manager to the conversation? Because now that we've freed up this cash flow, let's do some wise things with it. What does that look like for, for your um, deliverables? Yeah, we, we do like to stay in our lanes. Um, while I am licensed as a financial planner, I understand that's a whole other ball of yeah. wax, if you will. And so Realm, yeah. we we have uh, financial advisors that we like and recommend, but if someone's already working with one, we'll, yeah, we'll often say, hey, let's pass this information on to your financial advisor. Because now at a minimum, like worst case scenario, right? Worst case scenario, you can set aside this money for retirement going into the future is a pretty good outcome. Um, so you, we have that, or depending again on their growth, it's like, well, you're, you've been stagnant. So we could call in someone like yourself as a marketing expert and say, great, well, we just freed up some money you can invest into growth. And let's look at what that campaign looks like, but we're not the marketing experts. We don't. Right. You're the coach. Be. Yep. We're the coach. Yeah. We're the quarterback. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So then, um, you're you're strategically looking for opportunities. Do you also get into okay? Now we will do the filing of the taxes and things like that. Of course, and you do you do the bookkeeping, you do filing of the ta taxes, and then you just bring in other people um, that that are the professionals like uh, estate planning or financial planning things like that. That would uh, uh, be the experts there. Exactly, and yeah. I I would caution anyone who is dealing with one professional who claims they can do all those things themselves, yeah. unless they have a very small group of clients and they, you yeah. lucked out and they opened up a look, a spot for you. It, that is, there's just so much in all those different areas of things that people need to be experts on. There would be very few, what I would call uniques of nature that are capable of doing, being a master at all of those things. Yes, a hundred percent. You're uh, what you're jack of all trades, but master of none, master of, and, yeah, and that exactly. really. I mean, it's more than a cliche because it really is. Because let's think about something. Um, I, last count, the IRS tax code is how many pages? Twenty or thirty? Seventy-six. Seventy-six thousand. Yeah. Yeah, I knew it was some, I was going to say, ha ha, 20, 30, but more like 30 or 40,000, 76,000. Who in their right mind would know how to go through and read it 
at all and then know how what it means and then know how to apply it to your business so you know there's no way that let's just flip it around and and say a financial advisor could then give you tax advice because they have to stay up on their financial advising and compliance and all that so certainly they don't know the tax world and same with you so stay in your lane pick that expert um but let's talk a little bit about that tax code because you kind of take a strong stance um about the irs and you're using some strong <laughs> language and and that's awesome um but you say they're taking your money so um when you were working with the business with a business and we've already talked about some of the cash flow things but what are some of the low-hanging fruit that you're looking at on once you get the you know s corp or llc or all that kind of taken decided on what is some of the low-hanging fruit that you're watching for on overpaying in taxes yeah so with the s corp uh that's very low-hanging fruit if someone is earning what we call ordinary income or the tax code calls ordinary income uh but sometimes people come to us with an S corporation. And as part of that, the IRS does require owners to pay themselves a W-2 wage out of that entity. Mm -hmm. We have found most of the time that W-2 amount they're paying themselves is much higher than it needs to be. And so some low hanging fruit for S corp owners is you can reduce that and still be in compliance with the IRS and go ahead and save yourself the 15.3% on the amount that you're not paying that 15.3% represents the payroll tax they, they save. And then, you know, most people haven't read the 76,000 pages, which is shocking. I mean, I know how riveting. Yeah, right. right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's a great read. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the tax code tells us in order for something to be a deduction to reduce your income, it has to be ordinary and necessary. And if you think about those two words, they really aren't very descriptive or give us any help with what the heck the IRS is actually meaning there. So the uh, group of accountants actually came back and said, can you please be more helpful with your description here? Because we have a feeling our definition of ordinary necessary is different than yours, which it always is. And they said, oh, okay. So they put together their crack squad of the smartest people they could come up with. And they came up with, all right, so ordinary necessary, Here's two new words for you, helpful and appropriate. Oh, great. That's the best you could come up with. That cleared it right up. Yeah. So now we have four <laughs> words that are all very yeah. generic. And so the way I tell people is like some of the lowest hanging fruit is to understand what that really means. And this is what it means. If you're spending a dollar on your business and you can relate it to your business in any form, shape, or fashion, then it's likely a business expense and you should go ahead and pay for that out of your business account. Now, there are some pretty obvious exclusions, like you're never going to be able to write off your primary residence mortgage payment, mm -hmm. for example, as a business expense, mm -hmm. personal groceries, you know, never going to be a business expense. Now, it's not to mm -hmm. say groceries can't be, but they do expect everyone to have a bare minimum your day to day like living yeah supporting being alive expenses that yeah. you're not going to write off but I, if everyone can take that approach of first just change their paradigm okay if i am spending a dollar can i relate it to my business does it help me grow does it help me keep clients does it help me maintain clients am i building a relationship with somebody then you know let's look at the possibility of that being an expense um and then from there you can get into some specific things mileage People often misunderstand uh, like how to write off their vehicle. And so the IRS lets you take either your vehicle actual expenses or you can apply a mileage rate, which they come up with every year, to the number of business miles. Well, if my home address is also the main location for my business, then if I'm driving from that main location, I'm driving for work. Uh, for for my business, which is different than the rules that relate to W-2s and commuting miles. So there's some miles there. If I'm going somewhere to take on a purchase that will be a write-off, that's also going to be miles. Like a lot of people have more miles on the table that they don't claim that they should. Same goes with travel. Man, if you really take the time to think through uh, what your trip is, before you start spending money on the trip, if you can apply a business purpose to it, at least some of the trip can be written off, but a lot of times most of the trip can be written off. Um, and then 
it, we can get into this later if you want as like the congratulations for listening to this whole uh, session with the tax guy. Cause I know taxes sometimes aren't exciting <laughs> to people, but uh, uh, yeah. there's a tax strategy called, we call it corporate rent. If you, uh, a lot of people refer to it as the Augusta rule, but it's one wow. of the lowest hanging fruits that uh, all business owners can take advantage of. Awesome. And, and I think here's one thing, whenever I have these types of conversations is when you hear something like what you've already mentioned in, in Augusta rule, these are things that you don't hear in everyday um, conversation. So it's new to you as the business owner. That doesn't mean that it's wrong, shady, incorrect. It just means it's buried in 76,000 uh, pages <laughs> and you don't know how to uh, um, uh, take action on it. So when some of these things that are just laid out and, and you can attribute it back to, oh, IRS tax code, whatever, whatever, take advantage of it because it's leaving money on the table. Yeah, totally. Awesome. So what, what do you find when you're working with business owners? Um, what is the biggest challenge that people that they're facing right now regarding business in general? We've talked all about finance, but business in general, because I, I feel that, um, and, and it doesn't matter what time of year or what the date is, but just these days, businesses, I feel like are feeling the pressure. They've got to find employees. They got to keep employees. They got to keep revenues up. They got to keep expenses down. As, as a CEO of a business, what are you seeing uh, them struggle with the most? Oh, yeah. I think you actually hit it. I don't think there's any one single thing I'd say they're struggling with the most. Um, but I feel like the best solution to most of the struggles I do see is to people give to give themselves permission to take some time off. Mm. Um, it is amazing. And there's science that backs it. I actually have a book coming out in January called The 3.3 Rule which talks about a new workday structure instead of following the 40 hour work week, eight hour work days. Um, we are, we need breaks, especially in today's knowledge working environment. Our mind needs breaks and you, it seems counterintuitive that by taking some time off. And then when I say taking time off, I'm not saying like, Oh, I was doing tax returns and now I'm going to check my email. Like actually giving yourself a break, your mind a yeah. break, go for a walk, take a nap, listen to a comedian, uh, write in your journal, like just talk to someone, you know, those, those types of things for a break. You come back re-energized and rejuvenated instead without that, which is where our society is right now. You're just constantly working 24 seven. And if you're not at work, you're thinking about work. It just, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, these, so, so, you know, I'm going to mention the C word that rhymes with Ovid, you know, I mean, COVID <laughs> came and went and it's here. It's not whatever the case is. And guess what? We're going to have another thing like that in, in the near future, because remember this thing called nine 11, remember the uh, economic crash of 2007. Remember, I mean, there's, there's something that crops up every handful of years. So we're going to have something that impacts us personally, professionally. Um, but COVID, what that did, I feel one of the big things was, it made us go, we need to be virtual, digital, available all the time because we now can't meet with people in person. And now that we can, people are like, cool, but I can jump on Zoom and I can do this and I can do virtual. But the problem is what you just said. You're always on. And and the struggle to turn off at 5 p.m., 5.30, whatever the case is, and spend time personally with family or whatever. It's like, yeah, but my phone's right here. And yeah, but I can log on and I can do this. And man alive, um, just for, uh, we could probably bring a mental health expert in and just talk about how when you are just on all the time, it just drags on you and the stress that it uh, 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 gives. So I think that you've hit the nail on the head and there's not one easy solution to that. It's just got to be you've got to be committed to recognize that and then start making some progress toward uh, uh, mitigating as much as possible. You never will eliminate it. You won't eliminate it, which is why everyone needs their boundaries. So you have to establish the boundaries and respect them. I mean, it's funny, especially with COVID, the whole work from home thing uh, really obviously became popular. And I just laugh at the number of articles I read that say working from home is the best thing ever. And here's all the proof. And then you could read an article that says working from home is the devil. And here's the proof. Yeah. Yeah. Not very many people talked about, hey, working from home needs it's a case by case basis it's going to work for some yeah. people and it's not going to work yeah. for others yeah and, 
And those who do work from home who are successful at it, the commonality is they all have boundaries. Because without those, am I living in my office or am I working from home, right? And, yeah. and uh, the ones who successfully do it, they establish boundaries, they create routines, they create separation, even though they're in the, it, sometimes it's even a different physical space. Like here is the space I work in. And when I'm done working, I don't come back into this space until I come back, but we need, you know, I, I, I listened to a, a motivational speaker on YouTube and he says this, which relates right to what you said, are you living life or is life living you? You know, and it's like work-life balance. It's just blurred. The lines are blurred. So I think that is a, a huge, huge uh, piece revelation. So John, it's been so great chatting with you here. If someone is listening to this thinking, well, maybe uh, I would like to have John and his team take a look at my situation to see if I've got the right business structure and foundation. Where can I maximize cash flow? Where can I minimize taxes? What's the best way they can learn more and then also reach out and connect with you? Yeah. So our website is insightstax.com and it is spelled a little bit different because we're using the word insight as in to cause to action often used in the sentence, they incited a riot. Um, insightstax.com, I-N-C-I-T-E-T-A-X.com. We have a free blog and like some of the stuff we talked about, the Augusta rule, we go into details there. If you've ever heard about paying your kids, we have a lot of like, we try to provide as much free strategy as possible. Um, check us out there. And then if you are interested, Look at the contact us page and uh, a team member will reach out to you. Excellent. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Mike. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.